Welcome back to the Nutri Medical Report. We're joined by the illustrious uh, John Moore, who's a not only a former Special Forces in Vietnam, but a prepper consultant to uh, the powerful and famous, and has his own radio show on Republic Radio, Monday to Friday, 7 to 9 a.m., and has some numerous contacts. You've done some good homework, John. Tell us what the latest uh, news updates. And I did talk to Paul, your contact, this morning to corroborate what you mentioned last week. Yes, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Bill. Uh, I have limited time today. I have to, I have, I'm doing a Friday evening meetup every week, and, and I have to get ready for that. But regardless, uh, the uh, MERS uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome appears to be very lethal, uh, possibly as lethal as 60%, which is outrageously high. It has all the characteristics of a biological weapon, given the fact that uh, these people are dying under hospital care as opposed to some remote village with dirt floors and no electricity. Uh, when, when you die in a hospital uh, with the best of everything available, I regard that as very serious. Um, I think that mitigation needs to be looked at very seriously. I believe people need to consider uh, wearing masks in public uh, if they're in an area where this has been known to be about. Uh, I, I agree with you, Dr. Bill. We talked privately a couple of hours ago that uh, this summer of 2013 uh, could very well be devastating in terms of the spread of this uh, flu virus that is so lethal. So, I yeah, think if, if it is what we suspect it is, it's going to be, if not now, in the very near future, because I talked to Anne, and she worked out, I guess they worked out this, uh, it's called the uh, r not score, and she'll give us more detail in a few moments. But basically, the score determines whether it's likely to be pandemic. Problem is, it's, whether it's pandemic or not, if you get it, you got about 40 to 60 percent chance if you're an adult of dying. It tends to have a long incubation period. It tends to make kids very sick, but doesn't kill them, but it kills their parents. Well, children without parents, of course, would be a, a absolute disaster. Also, uh, people need to look at, uh, I believe, nutraceuticals uh, that you offer at your website for uh, improving their immune system. Yeah, and actually, anything? it'll kill the pathogen too, much right. better than any any uh, and, of the conventional and, antivirals or other drugs. We have most amazing, and we just launched our Alice and Med. We have the Silver 100 Complex and the Edgar Casey Diatomic Iodine and Immunoglobulins, Immunomax. We have things that stop the cytokine storm. The mixed mineral ascorbates of Power C Plus, Vitamin K2, Menaquinone 7, the Neutriodine, and of course the Diamine Oxidase, which is our um, Allergan we bring in from Switzerland. So we have a number of ways of turning off the cytokine storm that can kill you because it's not just the virus, it's your response that will kill you. And um, this is going to be bad because we have multiple bugs coming at us. It's not just the MERS-CoV-2, it's the H7N9 in China, it's the H5N1, it's the H1N1, and it's the H7N3 in Mexico. So any one of these now or a future recombinant could kill a lot of people and shut down civilization. Absolutely. Well, uh most adults, uh, especially adults over 50, take two or more prescription pharmaceutical products, and they need to be looking at ways to uh, uh, get themselves off those pharmaceutical products, in my opinion, uh, all of which uh, do nothing to improve your immune system, but in fact add to the compromised immune system. And, and increase the chances that if you run out of them, you're going to have a catastrophe. Like if you're on beta blockers, you need to be on and has stockpile your nutraceuticals, get off the darn things. You need to be on nutraceuticals, diet, lifestyle, and other things. Get yourself in shape, prep physically to be on a natural program because if civilization shuts down, you're not going to get your medicine. Absolutely. And the more pharmaceutical products that you take now, the worse off you're going to be. Uh, the odds of surviving something like this, if you're consuming pharmaceutical products, are dr dramatically diminished. Yeah, because if you stop beta blockers... You're going to stroke or have a heart attack. Absolutely. Well, what would you say the percentage of uh, adults in this country, doctor, are that uh, require some form of pharmaceutical product, uh, prescription pharmaceutical product, to stay alive? Um, over age 40. That over are age 40. not just a state. Yeah. Ninety percent. Ninety percent. Mm-hmm. That's scary. Yeah, that's Hypertension, scary. chronic infections. All kinds of other conditions, cancer, uh, they're taking antidepressants they consider staying alive because they commit suicide, although I think it just, it literally puts bars on their mind. But in terms of the number of people in, on various drugs from diabetes to hypertension, whatever, and a lot of these drugs, if you stop them abruptly, you'll have nasty consequences. 
Well, that's absolutely scary. And, of course, tonight at my meetup, I'll be talking about the effects of electromagnetic pulse, which would be uh, in combined with uh, a possible flu uh, pandemic, <laughs> would pretty much knock out uh, 90% of the people on this planet. The likelihood of a, um, of a bond market blowout happening parallel with an airborne plague is about, I'd say, 90% in the next uh, 12 to 16 months. And the likelihood of an airborne CME either from a uh, coronal mass ejection from a, from a solar event from a comet or caused by an expanding war that's happening in the Middle East with Iran, which has this technology, or Syria or North Korea, is also, if the war starts, it's a guaranteed 100%. They will use it against us. Well, Syria is what I refer to a first-tier client state of Russia, as opposed to a second-tier state like like uh, Iraq was, where <laughs> Saddam Hussein's uh, MiG fighters uh, were buried in the sand for lack of spare parts and the engineers to keep them running. That's not the case with Syria. They will have uh, first-tier uh, and aircraft bought, defense did, systems and, and so forth. They just bought 10 more, by the way, and the Russians are more than happy to give them. They probably give them time payments. Well, keep in mind, you, you don't. the UPS doesn't just drop this stuff off. When you take delivery of sophisticated weapon systems, you also have Russian engineers and technicians on the ground. Right. These are highly sophisticated. If you don't have daily uh, uh, access to the people that manufacture these for spare parts, as well as the factory-trained technicians, they simply won't function. So exactly. that, that tells me that Syria is a first-tier client state with Russians on the ground operating yeah, I, I, and maintaining these sophisticated th systems. And one of the things that I disagreed with uh, with Joel Skousen is he thinks that Russia is going to back off from Syria. I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. And then here's my logic on this. I think that, number one, most people aren't aware that half the entire Russian army are Shiite Muslims from Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, etc., all these stand republics in Iran. They all look up to the mullahs in Iran uh, and, the, uh, and the prophecies to the Shiite uh, Muslims, which means there's literally hundreds of thousands now volunteering to fight in Syria or Iran if war starts there. The volunteer now. Not just in Russia, but all these other stand republics. They're volunteering to fight the uh, the uh, Saudi Arabian uh, uh, warmongers. And by the way, the king of Saudi Arabia is in a coma. He's basically functionally dead, but they're keeping his body from re achieving room temperature. <laughs> oh, God. Right. Well, they got some problem with the uh, uh, succession over there. Who's going to be next? Oh, because the thing is, it's like a, a pit of snakes, you know. Uh, there's uh, things like 16 families. Uh, the British decided to put the Saad family because they were nastiest of the brood. And the fact is, all these billionaires are at each other's throats with a long, curved sword. <clears throat> um, anybody that finally gets in the position has probably got one foot, foot in the banana peel and the other one in the grave. So uh, there really are, are other people that, quote, make the decisions. Uh, there's direct integration between some of the worst elements in Israel and the worst elements in Saudi Arabia. Most people don't realize that there's some dark alliances there. Um, but the Israelis are doing suicidal things like their attack on that weapons depot and the sheep farm. And the Syrians now launch, uh, uh, unveil their surface-to-surface -surface missiles, so if there's any attack on Syria, even if they nuke Damascus, which I think will happen in the future, uh, there won't be a square inch of Israel fit for a human being or even a cockroach to survive. Well, that's where this is headed in a hurry. When I need to get running here, but we just need to remind everybody, doctor, that they need to remember the basics for preparedness. Yeah, preparedness is, yeah, and, and do something every day. I mean, I always am working on my prepper bag, on my home, talking to my friends. Everywhere I go, I'm a pain in the butt. You got to be a pain in the butt. You got to tell people, what prepare. Even if, And the thing is, they'll look at you and say, well, you're strange, but maybe it makes sense now. You know, the day that, it all, that all of them say, go ahead. We have lots of updates, and uh, especially what you just mentioned on the break, which is pretty shocking. I mean, it's it's amazing how much bad news there is out there. And I often see bad news as a kind of an opportunity for us to kind of get our act together. Unfortunately, I see a lot of apathetic people. A lot of people want to accuse the people that report news as being kind of 
conspiracy theorists when we're just reporting something that's a that's a plain fact. And uh, this latest thing is almost like an American Fukushima. It's a landfill site, not far from St. Louis. It's on fire. Can you tell us all about it? Yeah, well, a fire was. Uh, this is a large land, landfill that's right outside of Lambert Airport. In case uh, listeners have have flown into Lambert Airport, it's an international airport, and uh, it's uh, the, there's a layer of trash in there has been burning since uh, 2010. So we're talking three years that it's been burning, and it recently has become a nuisance, and the residents surrounding that are are complaining of the odor. And uh, so they they decided what they would do is that they would that they would uh, they, well what they're going to do is they're going to take out the pipes that vent the thing and uh, then they're going to cap it. Well, that's not going to stop the fire. <laughs> so, no. and the people are complaining. They say, "Well, by the way, did you forget that there's a radioactive waste dump uh, about 1,200 feet away?" Mm that was filled in 1970 from radioactive waste that was created during the World War II, during the Manhattan Project. So Malincrot here in St. Louis was the uh, contractor that did that. And of course right. it was all done illegally, And uh, but you know our standards changed over the time. We no longer think it's safe to store radioactive material by housing. So um, people weren't... Um, you know, when they said that there was just the smell they were going to fix, they, they weren't anxious to move out because they were afraid of vandalism on their property. Uh -huh. But but it seems like what happened is that um, the, um, the uh, landfill, there's been some kind of soil subsidence, and uh, so the the radioactive landfill, the radi the radioactive material has gotten closer to the Bridgeton landfill. And uh, not only that, the EPA d designated it as a Superfund site in 1990, which was what uh, 20 years ago, 23 years ago. And uh, they they think the plan might be done next year because. Uh, Anyway, they don't want to dig up the smoldering waste because they could expose it to oxygen, which could start the flames and make matters worse. And uh, so uh, people that lived there had been unwilling to move because of the vandalism they feared on their homes. And uh, now they're, they're thinking, well, I think we better move because this thing, if it could, it could spark an explosion in the methane pockets or buried gas cylinders throwing radioactive particles into the air. And this is by a professor of earth and planetary science at Washington University in St. Louis. So this is a credible source. Right. And uh, the fire could also create subsurface voids that might expose nuclear waste to wind and rain. And it's, it's, this landfill sits in the Missouri River floodplain. So, you know. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah that sounds and, like uh, it's not far from Kansas, though, is it? So Dorothy might be saying, oh, my, oh, my. Oh, my, oh, my. <laughs> Remember, well, remember the Wizard of Oz. I'm thinking, uh, it's like, yeah, you know, uh, wow, this is not good. Oh, well, you can just call us Eastern Kansas, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is not good, and it just keeps yeah. getting worse. You know, so, every time in other words, the reason why it, the reason why Oz is green, and maybe this area near this landfill, is because it's radioactive, or going to be shortly. That's exactly right, and the people don't want to raise children by it. Can you believe that? Especially girl children, because you don't want radioactivity getting into your women children, especially strontium-90. Now, I don't think there's any strontium-90 there, but I don't know what's there, because I don't, you know, they, they well, just have designated it as a Superfund site that was in 1990, and they don't have, they don't have a plan for determining what's there until next year. Wow. And meanwhile, this fire keeps getting closer to it, and we, I suspect that it's probably methane. But the problem with methane in a landfill is that it's full of, full of contaminants. We studied land, landfills. And uh, one of the worst contaminants is vinyl chloride. Now, you may, that may sound familiar to you, vinyl chloride, because you've probably heard of polyvinyl chloride, right. which is a plastic. Well, as it deteriorates, the bonds break, and it becomes vinyl chloride, which is a gas that is highly carcinogenic. So it not only is it 
highly carcinogenic, but you breathe it in. I mean, it's in the air, and you breathe it in. So if they're if they're going to flare off, if they're going to go down and try to set the methane on fire, they're also going to release vinyl chloride into the air. Oh my! Yeah, this is like the uh, this is like the Roundup Ready areas. I was listening to a program the other day. Roundup Ready areas of uh, of South Dakota and elsewhere up there, where there's so much Roundup in the ground because of Roundup Ready crops that you know it's in the drinking water, it's in the air, it's literally everywhere. It's in the bread. I mean. You know, well, not only that, world. now they're growing Roundup resistant weeds. <laughs> Those are the well, only the things that are growing resistant. up there. The, the weeds are going to get resistant whether we like it or not. I mean, that's yeah. just, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, this thing just keeps getting worse and worse, and some high school student, or maybe it was a college student, did a survey, did a uh, survey of radiation, discovered she did it all on Facebook, and, uh, Oh, no, she did a survey of uh, the people that live in the area, and she was documenting the cancers that they had had. Right. And she discovered a cancer cluster, and one thing led to another, and they finally identified it as the landfill. Oh, my. So uh, I give her credit for doing that. I thought that was very bold of her. I don't think she knows how blacklisted she'll be. Oh, no, no. Listen, I heard the latest reports that uh, was kind of like a bold statement that... Uh, uh, you know, that Obama has a list. This is somebody actually inside uh, the IRS that said, oh, no, Obama's got a list to everyone that would surprise you. I mean, it could be on your, your mother, your sister, yourself. Uh, he has an, a dossier on everybody. He knows all your credit cards, even your receipts from leaving a parkade. Uh, and so when you do something like this that really pisses off the establishment, you're on what's called the red your dead list. Oh. Huh. Red, your, you know, those color coding things are real. Red, you're dead, right? Oh, blue, red, you're we're dead. Gonna put you in dog. <laughs> yeah, red, you're dead. You're not going to get into the civil detention camp. We have a bullet. It was an engraved name on the side of the bullet for you. Uh, we have the blue camp where we're going to try to change you because you might be changeable. Our relatives have convinced us, your relatives, that maybe we can do a kind of lobotomy or you know, psychic mind transfer, like, you know, a Vulcan mind meld and turn you into something more like a cyborg. Or, And then, of course, there's a green, which just means you're either passive or you don't care, or you're just one of the Borg. <laughs> so it's better to be a slacker than to be somebody who's uh, an irritant. Better to die saying? with your boots on. Better to die with your boots on. Uh, but you're old school. Yeah, old school, bad school. Innovative bad school. How's that? important topics to talk about. The first one is the uh, MERS-CoV-2, which is a Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome, Coronavirus Subclass 2. And we now have hot spots in France, Germany, Britain, and now in America. I got a call this morning, early this morning, from Paul Martin in Colorado uh, about an intimate uh, member, a military member, who didn't travel to the Middle East but had friends and colleagues that went there, get violently sick, in three days had his temperature spike over 104, Basically, he's hanging on to life by his fingernails, which is not doing very good. Uh, this virus, if you look at the case fatality rates in Germany and France and elsewhere, where it's perped up in eastern Saudi Arabia, uh, it makes children very sick, but usually doesn't kill them. But it kills adults, and it tends to be twice as lethal for adult males as females. Case fatality rate is somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. So if you get it, your chances are a flip of a coin whether you're going to live. And that's with ex ex advanced medical care respiratory care, intubation, uh, you know, intravenous induced coma, uh, maybe, uh, you know, heart-lung bypass machine. I mean, basically, cytokine storms, lungs dissolving, uh, angels flying around you, uh, time to go and see Jesus kind of time. And people don't realize that I'm, I've been predicting this for some time, and it's not scaremongering. I tell people, if you're ready, it's no big deal. You've got your nutraceuticals, you have your packages of all your nutraceuticals and your things to protect yourself. You can hunker down for a period of weeks until this darn thing passes. 
But if you have to go and quote the community to travel to work to do anything, you're putting yourself in grave danger. And you know that's why you need our NIOSH N95 masks, our defense wipes, our antipathogenics, because there's nothing that the conventional medical system has that will stop this. But we do. We have neutriodine, diatomic iodine, the silver 100 will kill viruses on contact, and we have the new Allison Med. We have Alamax. Um, we have immunoglobulins, Immunomax. We have things that turn off the cytokine storm like Power C+, full vitamin K2, neutriodine, and Allergon, which is diamine oxidase. There's no need for you to sweat over this virus. But those who aren't prepared, they're going to get taken down. And the first group of people that are the biggest knuckleheads are healthcare providers. When this first hits, most of the doctors, nurses, EMTs, and primary care contact people are going to get violently ill. And if we lose a large percentage of them, the rest of them will stay home to protect their families. So you're going to see a collapse of the healthcare system almost instantly as soon as the first wave of this hits, and a lot of the healthcare providers die. They'll they'll go home. Yeah. Well, I think this is the second um, the second uh, virus manipulation. We had SARS, and that was in uh, 2000 and what five? So that testing, was about eight testing, years one, ago. two, three. T- you're testing, testing. Yes, and, and when it comes when it comes by or recombines, maybe a little later this fall or next year, or another one emerges like H seven N nine, and we don't think SARS is going to come back because it has this R naught number, which is point seven three or whatever, and it doesn't look like, even though it's very lethal, it'll spread rapidly. Just a minor recombinant change of one DNA letter may be all you need for this to turn into a, you know, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde monster virus. So, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Go ahead, uh, Ann. Yeah, the SARS came out about eight years ago, and of course it was highly transmissible, and the incubation period was very short, and uh, so they were able to stamp it out. So it's uh, R naught number, which is the basic rep. Reproductive number uh, had, uh, was very high. It was above one anyway. And uh, as noted epi- epidemiologist David N. Fisman has uh, calculated an R naught number for this MERS, which is, I believe, the second ball out of the chute. And uh, he says that he thinks that the uh, R naught is probably about 0.7576. And uh, when the R naught is equal to one, then one person who has the disease will transmit it to one person who does not have the, the disease, and uh, so you don't really get an epidemic, except that you have a continual, you have a uh, you have a population that carries this virus forward in time, and an R naught uh, value greater than one becomes an epidemic, and that's generally what the that's one of the that's one of the factors that's used to determine how big the ap- epidemic will be. I got a new term about where it is called. Well, I will use a new term. If it's going to be like one case makes one case and it just trickles out, well, it's called a trickle demic. In other words, it doesn't <laughs> explode. But if there's a minor recombination, just one DNA letter. And by the way, if the host is exposed to radioisotopes, extreme stress, whatever, it makes the virus mutate and change. Or recombination with another virus would just decide to have, you know, viral sex and swap some DNA. They do that. They do funky things, viruses. And yeah, once and that they, happens, they could, yeah, they, what, would, what, they would do that inside the human body. Right, that's a mixing vessel inside the person, or a pig, or a factory farm animal, uh, or a wild goose, or anything. I mean, any animal where you can get more than one of these viruses together, because a lot of the, there's a lot of coronaviruses that are endemic out in the community there, and wild birds, etc. And all you need to do is have a mixing vessel where this version of the virus recombines, and now you've got a super virus that can go to human receptor binding domain, spread quickly between humans, and has a case, high case fatality rate. In specific groups like elderly, like you know, males versus females, adults, not children, and uh, you got a pandemic. And then if you're over two and a half to five percent case fatality rate, you have society that's going to shut down. It means well, nobody's they, they getting anything. They haven't found any reservoir in any animal population, so they're not or in, in insect population. They think the reservoir. They think that this virus was made for humans. So it, we think it came out yeah. of the laboratory. And we oh, think yeah. we're doing the beta testing on the second version now. You know, three strikes and you're out. The third, yeah, but, but, the third but version. Loading the, gun, loading the gun, Ann, will take two years. If this is not going to be a pandemic, it means they're loading the gun so the virus, just like H5N1, 
back in 10 years ago when H5N1 was coming up, you know, 10 years, 2003, mm -hmm. uh, H5N1 was not in every continent. It's now in the bird populations of every continent. So we now have an endemic load of H5N1 to draw from, to recombine with any new versions. So H5N1 now is the chambers are loaded. This novel coronavirus will load the chambers with all kinds of endemic viruses that are similar to novel coronavirus too, all over the world. And so if it doesn't become a pandemic, it'll load the chambers and come back to at us in the next one or two years. Okay, so let's say that R0 is uh, 0.5. That's an easier illustration than 0.75. And uh, that means that if the primary case has to, has to if it's, if it's 0.5, he has to, he will give it to one of two people. In other words, he won't give it to every person he meets. He'll give it to one of two people. And then those people would have to, those people that are infected, that person that is infected would have to give it to four people one of four people, and then that person that's infected would have to give it to one of eight people, and so on and so forth. So um, it, it does transmit, but it transmits until it runs out of steam, and that's what causes the cluster, and that's what we're seeing with the current MERS. Now, I'm not saying that they aren't going to come out with a, with a, uh, with another one that will, that will have an R naught greater than one. Uh, I'm saying that they probably will, and that that one will then uh, become epidemic. They don't have any vaccine. They don't have any treatment. If you get it and you end up in the hospital, you have 50% chance of dying. Now, um, what can we do? We can maintain sanitary practices. That is, we want to maintain social distances. That's six feet between you and the person you're talking to. We want to... Uh, Make sure that we wear a medical mask when we're out in a crowd where we can't avoid contacts. And by the way, they don't know how this thing is transmitted yet, and they don't know uh, what the incubation period is. So they've got a lot to learn about it still. And and what I've heard is that they suspect it's very long, like 7 to 10 days at least, which means a long incubation period is extremely bad because you can spread the virus to thousands of people before they actually start getting it. And once the virus starts having the capacity to cause either a cytokine storm or a cardiorespiratory failure, then you got a really bad situation on your hands. I have put a hand-washing chart on my homepage, on my webpage. I tell people, take the Silver 100 and spray your hands where you touch anything. Carry a bottle in your pocket, just shh, shh, everywhere you go. Don't touch your face unless you spray your hands. It will cut down on the viruses. And you uh, had some amazing uh, things to say on the break. Uh, the According to Professor McCann, will be back on the show in the next uh, week or so. Uh, he says, it's most of the crazy weather is a plasma, plasma physics occurring in the upper atmosphere. And not only that, what you just mentioned was this storm, even though it was only category two across the landmass of Central America, that's not normal. We're that is seeing not a mass normal, and I want to yeah. bring it to, to people's attention. Right. We may have cro we may have passed the tipping point, Doctor Bill. Yeah, the other thing you mentioned is that we're seeing storm systems are even reminiscent of that film a few years ago called "The uh, Day After Tomorrow," where you get storm cells that are a thousand miles across, like the current one sitting. We also have the Harp map, which you sent to me, and I have it posted up, which is a high altitude aurora array project a map showing that directed energy is actually focused over the central United States in Oklahoma. That storm system is a thousand miles across. That's not freaking normal. Which means that somebody there, and I prayed on it as well as studying this and talking to all my experts, the word I get in, in big letters is drought. The globalists want to drought out the central United States, the grain belt. They want to drought out Oklahoma and, and Texas because these are the patriot states. If Texas doesn't vote in June at the end of their session before the, June, or the, the summer recess, they leave the union. They have to vote to stay in the United States every year. It's not the other way around. And people don't understand if Texas left, America ceases to exist, and Obama needs to get a job at McDonald's, Mickey D's, because he wouldn't qualify for anything else. He's not a good lawyer. He's not a good civil rights person because the Democrats now are totally pissed with him. The guy has never accomplished anything, and he'll have to get a job at Mickey D's. Well, you said something about the Chinese wanting to use the port of Campeche. 
in the Gulf of Mexico to get there. Is that right? Or is it the Via other side? So what they do is uh, that all the Hudgens of Mompoa and the People's Republic of Army own all the Series 100 highways, all the ports, including Freeport, Bahamas, the largest port on the East Coast, bringing in traffic. And, in fact, they act as proxies for our, uh, our goods coming into the United States in containers. They're not even overseen by our own container experts. So as a result, the Chinese basically have got a carte blanche and uh, what they're doing now, too, is they're, they're basically scouring the land. Some places the rain hasn't fallen enough to refill lakes in Texas for six years. And as a result, we have a disaster. So we have the aquifers are not being refilled. We've got uh, farmland going, animals dead. It's like some kind of B-movie, old western where you see all you know, the, the cow skull with the horns sticking out of the ground. Uh, it's just nuts. And remember now, uh, this is my recommendation. If you're a Texan... You need to get that idiot, uh, Rick Perry, out of office and put somebody who really has some brains and is not an alcoholic. And what you need to do is call up the Russians, and here's the dialogue. Ring, ring. We heard that you're calling us in Russia because we can modify weather. Uh, you pay us American dollars, we be there with uh, Aeroflot jet tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. sharp Texas time. We fix it, you have as much rain as you like. No problem. We know your credit good. You're good Texans. The, if Russia flew with their air flight jets and their systems in, they can have it rain as much as Texas wants tomorrow. Now, five nations have major weather modification. The most portable system on Earth is the Russian. The best physicists on Earth with scalar uh, multidimensional physics are the Russians. They're six decades ahead of everybody else, even though we have more advanced weapon systems in space, etc. The best physicists on Earth are Russian. And they would bring a weather modification system that was about six, seven years ago, where a major cyclone was heading toward uh, uh, Buenos Aires. And um, the Russians called them saying, hey, guess what? We have system. We can fly in, move storm away so it doesn't hit your city. And then guess what? They did. Wow. Now, so people need to grasp this. Why the hell are we allowing our aquifers not to be recharged? Why are we allowing idiots like Obama to sit on the XL pipeline? We even have better hydrofracking techniques, by the way. There's a new system called a web system that doesn't need to use chemicals, that doesn't need to have multiple drill sites all over the damn place, like a, you know, a mosquito hitting you in 50,000 places. Why are we tolerating buying... Uh, you know, oil from these oil shakes that want to kill us all and uh, these maniacs and dynastic wells that now own our presidency. Our president was paid for by a billionaire, Saudi billionaire. Um, you know, basically we have a Muslim in the White House. Why are we tolerating this? You know, I, I really think that what needs to happen is a real simple step, three-step process. Texas secedes, we reform the union, we reform the corporation of America because that's what it is, we decide to take control of our money system and create a Hamiltonian credit. We wall off derivatives. We jail all the bankers. We decide to build our infrastructure of high-speed rail across the country. We uh, absolutely start to make deals, upfront deals with countries like China and so on, but we absolutely will not tolerate any military expansionism. And guess what? We can do business. We should be natural allies with the Chinese and the Russians, not enemies. For the globalists, it's their advantage to make sure that we're natural enemies. We're not. We're actually natural allies, believe it or not. Okay, well, I want to tell you about this Hurricane Barbara mm -hmm. that occurred this last week. And it was uh, it started out in the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of Mexico down by its border with Guatemala. Right. And it got up to a Category 2. And instead of, instead of turning and going out into the Pacific, it continued on a track to the north. And it went over the uh, isthmus of Mexico, and yeah, it's it emerged moved in the it. Gulf of Mexico. Now, this was only a Category 2. It, it, it's probably being steered. Now, let me explain how they steer it. There's a thing called toroidal waves, and you're familiar with what a toroidal wave is, right? No. It basically, it's a wave that has three-dimensional structure to it. Oh. So you create a toroidal wave, and what it does is it imbues energy to the atmosphere and charges up the plasma of the ionosphere. It can pull storm cells in. It can move them like a joystick around. And if you focus a toroidal wave like a pinwheel over an area, it will eventually, over a week or so, pull storm cells into the central part of the pin and literally rotate them around that pin as it moves those storm cells wherever you want. And you don't have to put a lot of energy to do it. It's like... It's like blowing on a, on a spinning top, and your little light breath will make the top move across the glass table. So that's what they're doing. Well, okay, but I have a simpler explanation. Uh -huh, now, this, this Category 2 Hurricane Barbara, so it went over the landmass, 
Now, normally, hurricanes have traditionally followed the track of the warm water temperatures. Right. But, but because it went over the landmass, this may indicate that the amount of water in the air may now be guiding the hurricanes. In other words, we have we have. Well, I think I think level. it's both. I think I, I think you have a point, but I think we don't only have more water. We have three factors that are going on. First off, we're in a higher energetic part of space. There's more cosmic particles that act as micronuclei for rainfall. Number two, we have uh, the, the, the jet stream and the uh, Gulf Stream that was tied to the Gulf Loop Current, which was disrupted uh, three years ago with Dr. Zangari from the Frascati Institute uh, and institutions here in America and Britain and Europe. All have proven that now that the loop current's destroyed, the pacemaker for the world oceanic uh, currents, which is like the radiator for the world, is all screwed up. And then the third factor is plasma physics from these near-Earth objects, such as the Ison comet, the J stars, etc. The plasma physics are actually in planetary alignments, change interplanetary plasma physics, which charge up the ionosphere, and that ionospheric charging moves storm cells. All of the advanced weapon systems that I get exposed to because I took care of employees at Buckley and Peterson Bay Air Force Base, U.S. Space Command, all of the weather modification weapon systems to weaponize planet Earth, are all based on plasma toroidal physics. And there's five nations that have some degree of this technology. America is the most advanced. The Russians are the most portable. And the Russians, I would say, are up, are up there with us. They can trigger off earthquakes, trigger off superstorms, trigger off volcanoes, move storms around like with a joystick. It's crazy. And the fact that we suffer from these storms, the storm like the Sandy that hit New Jersey, the mm -hmm. fact that we suffer from hurricanes or tornadoes, I find obscene. I think a, a series of good minds like Michio Kako, you know, I think out of the box. I was supposed to go into plasma physics, nuclear physics at MIT. I went into honors biochemistry. I finished my Ph.D. research project in marine molecular biology in five months at age 21. When I apply my mind to this and spend months and years studying it, this is simple to fix. Every city would have surrounded plasma cannons to unravel the storm cells around any city. They'd use not only regular radar, but the new advanced uh, special call space-based Doppler-type radar, which is more advanced, so it could pick up even nanoparticles coming from a volcano, which you can't see ordinarily, which are dangerous for flights, because a regular radar won't pick up these particles that will rip the jet engines to shreds. And what it would do is it would unravel these storm cells and prevent tornadoes from happening anywhere. We could also direct weather, make sure the rainfall is exactly what we want. I mean, why? Why do we suffer from this? It's because Dr. the powers of be. Yeah, well, it, it, the thing is, I'm a leader, not a, not a president. If I was a leader, I would lead and try to, to draw on the brilliance of the population out there and inspire people, like it says in the Bible, like Moses, you know. He led by example. He led by inspiring people what they could have rather than what they have, which is a lie. And we don't have a leader in the White House. We don't have a leader in our state house. We don't have a leader in any of the countries of the world where Canada, Britain, Australia. We have politicians, many bloodsuckers. Many bloodsuckers. They have to first love the Most High God, love their fellow man, want a future posterity of mankind that can serve and worship their Creator God, their Father. And then we will have peace on earth. <laughs>